MLB's top prospects are sometimes at their highest level of value before they reach the highest level of play. A few times each year, experts weigh in on which prospects will succeed in the majors, but even though prospect rankings hold value, they are never close to fully accurate. MLB.com's 2011 preseason top prospect list included future stars like Gary Sanchez, Chris Sale, Manny Machado, Zach Britton, Freddie Freeman, and Will Myers, but not one of those guys had cracked the top 10. So, who was expected to be even better than those perennial all-stars? Let's take a look at what happened to the top 10 prospects from 2011. The Braves signed Julio Tehran as a 16-year-old amateur free agent out of Cartagena, Colombia in 2007. After a 2010 season where he was excellent in A-ball, high A, and double A, Julio ranked 10th on this list at just 20 years old. Scouts cited his mid-90s fastball, above-average curveball, and excellent changeup, as well as good command all around. After his first spring training invite in 2011, he would go on to throw an excellent 2.55 ERA for the AAA Gwinnett Braves. This would earn him an appearance in the Futures game, as well as a few spot starts in the bigs. His first full big league season came in 2013, where he was great, but his 2014 season would be his best, as he threw 221 innings with a 2.89 ERA. His numbers took a step back in 2015, but he was once again an all-star in 2016, the season in which he would walk his lowest number of batters per 9 innings. Julio would never replicate that season's level of performance again, and the Braves let him walk as a free agent after three more solid but unspectacular seasons. Although he's only 30 now, his career is seemingly on life support, as he struggled mightily in 2020 in Anaheim, where his fastball velocity was about 4 miles per hour slower than it was when he broke into the league. Most of his primary pitches play from 81 to 89 miles per hour, not enough variation to trick most big league bats. He's trying to show the league that he still has something left in the tank as a sinker baller with Detroit, although he was placed on the 60-day IL with a shoulder injury after just one start. If this is it for Julio, he's had a solid career and is a two-time All-Star, but failed to remain at the levels that he flashed in his early 20s. Baseball fans probably remember Jesus Montero for one of three reasons. His first great month with the Yankees, his steroid suspension, or his weight. Montero signed with the Yankees as an amateur free agent in 2006 and he proceeded to crush lower level minor league pitching and dominate double A from 2007 through 2009. After solid triple A seasons in 2010 and 2011, and despite a rising strikeout rate, the Yankees called him up in September of 2011 where he put up an impressive slash line and 4 homers in 18 games. After the Yankees shipped him to Seattle for Michael Pineda, he got a shot to play every day for the Mariners, but was mediocre in 2012 and downright bad in 2013. About a month and a half into the 2013 season, Montero was demoted back to the minors to learn how to play first base and he would never catch a game again. He would tear his meniscus in June and be suspended for 50 games for his involvement in the Biogenesis scandal in August. He hit rock bottom in 2014, showing up to camp weighing in at 275 pounds, 40 pounds over his target weight. In just two seasons in Seattle, he went from being a top 10 prospect with Miguel Cabrera and Mike Piazza player comps to having zero expectations from his own general manager. He would play a few dozen more games for Seattle before bouncing around in the minor leagues and the Mexican league before being out of baseball altogether by the end of 2018. Montero was as talented as anyone, but his work ethic and attitude ultimately caused his downfall. Ironically, his last highlight in the bigs involves someone who will show up later on this list. This one's out towards center field, towering shot, chasing Trout back. That ball's hit pretty good, and at the wall, Trout leaps up, and he got it! Oh my! Are you serious? Mike Moustakis and Eric Hosmer were highly touted high school position player prospects as Mike was selected second overall by the Royals in 2007 and Eric was selected one year later with the third overall pick, joining Moustakis in the Royals farm system. They both saw success until reaching high A ball where they struggled as teammates in 2009 but they also both broke out in 2010 with Moustakis finding his way up to AAA that season and both of them finding their names on this list. They were teammates once again to begin 2011 in AAA but this was short lived as Hosmer was recalled in May. Moustakis would join him in Kansas City a month later. Hosmer got off to a good start, finishing third in Rookie of the Year voting, but Moustakis struggled. Hosmer's bat was there, but his defense was poor, while Moustakis couldn't hit, but he handled the hot corner well. By 2014, questions began to arise about the tandem, as both struggled, with Moustakis even being sent back to AAA after an incredibly weak start. However, when the playoffs rolled around, the two former super prospects were on full display as the new faces of the Royals. Although they fell to Madison Bumgarner and the Giants, they would be back with a vengeance in 2015 and help lead the Royals to their first World Series in 30 years.
This core of the Royals will not see further success, and Hosmer left for San Diego on an 8-year contract after 2017. Although Moustakis set the team home run record with 38 home runs that year, he would be the next one out the door, being traded to the Brewers in 2018. Moose made the switch to second base with the Milwaukee, and he would go on to sign a 4-year deal with the Reds after the 2019 season. He's been a solid bat in recent years thanks to his ability to use the whole field. While Hosmer's contract initially looked like it would be an albatross, his offense has improved greatly in the last two years, thanks in part to an increase in launch angle. So far, Hosmer's had a solid career and been the face of the 2015 World Champion Royals, so he's far from a bust, but it would be nice to see him take the next step in terms of power hitting in San Diego. Moustakis has been the more productive of the two, especially in recent seasons, and his career matches up well with what the scouts said about him back in 2011. Looking back on it now, the Royals can be nothing but ecstatic with how these guys turned out. Aroldis Chapman's story is probably the most well known so far, so I'm not going to spend too much time on how he got here. But for those who don't know, he generated loads of big league interest pitching for the Cuban national team as a starter. After a failed defection attempt in 2008 and multiple arrests of associates, Chapman successfully defected in 2009 and signed with the Reds for 6 years and $30 million in January of 2010. That's a very abridged version of his story, so if you're interested in a full summary, check out this video by Baseball Doesn't Exist. Anyway, back to Chapman. Although he began his 2010 season as a starter in AAA, he performed so well out of the bullpen that he found himself on the Reds roster by late August. He wowed in his short stint in the majors in 2010, frequently throwing triple-digit fastballs and even throwing the fastest recorded pitch ever in big league history at 105.1 miles per hour. He even got the chance to throw in the playoffs that season. Aroldis only threw 13 and a third innings for the big league club in 2010, so he still qualified for this list. After being called up to the bigs as a reliever for good in 2011, he struggled with his control, walking over 7 batters per 9 innings that season. While he wasn't bad, his 2012 season would be his best to date, as he recorded a career low 1.51 ERA and under 5 hits and 3 walks per 9 innings. During spring training of 2014, Chapman was struck in the skull by a Salvador Perez line drive. He underwent a 2.5 hour long surgery and had a titanium plate inserted into his skull. Luckily, he got back on the mound for the Reds in early May with no lasting effects, and he finished the season with over 100 strikeouts for the third straight year. Another road bump arose for Chapman after the 2015 season as he was accused of domestic violence and although he wasn't charged, he was suspended for 30 games. The Dodgers were about to trade for him until this news was revealed. Eventually, Chapman was traded to the Yankees for low-level prospects. After serving the suspension, he played a few months with the Yankees before being dealt at the deadline to the Cubs, helping the team to its first championship in 108 years. He then re-signed with the Yankees for 5 years and $86 million. For most of his career, he's relied on his four-seam fastball and slider, although he's recently thrown more sinkers and even added a splitter to his repertoire. He's going to be remembered as one of the best relief pitchers of the 2010s, and his durability is impressive considering how much force he throws with. Despite risking everything to defect from Cuba, a life-threatening injury on the mound, and off-the-field troubles, Aroldis has been the most consistently valuable player covered on this list so far, and he has been the best reliever in baseball again this season. Dustin Ackley was drafted by the Mariners second overall out of UNC in 2009. Scouts loved his advanced hitting ability as well as his presence while at bat, combined with his well above average speed. The Mariners drafted him with the hope that he would be their center fielder, but there were questions about where he'd play on defense. He would make his presence felt immediately in their system, winning the 2009 Arizona Fall League MVP and progressing up to AAA in his first minor league season in 2010. Dustin began 2011 at AAA, walking more than striking out, playing solid second base, and having an impressive slash line, leading to a call up in June. He would impress at the big league level for the rest of the year. Despite the promise, 2011 would be his best offensive season in nearly every metric. He had a disappointing 2012 at the plate, and in 2013, the Mariners tried to move him out to center field, but he wasn't great in the 50 games he played there. In 2014, his hitting was the best since his rookie campaign, but his career low walk rate led to an on-base percentage under 300, and he had his worst defensive season to date, playing as Seattle's full-time left fielder. After struggling to start off 2015, Ackley was shipped off to the Yankees, where he had an excellent September offensively. Despite this, injuries hindered his performance and kept him off the field for most of 2016, and he would never return to the majors again. Had he stayed at second base, where he impressed metrically, Ackley could have perhaps been a more valuable asset, but he was not good enough of a hitter to cover up his subpar outfield defense. For a second overall pick, this career is somewhat disappointing, but I definitely blame the Mariners for failing Ackley more than Ackley for failing the Mariners. As a multi-sport star in high school, Dominic Brown was months away from joining the Miami Hurricanes football team as a wide receiver. 
MLB teams figured that they had no chance of signing him if they drafted him, so he fell to the 20th round of the 2006 draft. However, the Phillies took a chance on him and offered him a $200,000 signing bonus, which he couldn't turn down, and he officially became a pro baseball player. He profiled as a big athletic center fielder who was raw at the plate but had unteachable power potential. After a few strong years in the lower minors, he broke out in 2010, crushing AA and AAA pitching enough to get the call, although he struggled in the 70 plate appearances he got in the majors that year. 2011 and 2012 were much the same, starting off with a strong AAA stint and then struggling in the majors. Brown became the starting left fielder for the Phillies in 2013, and although he struggled in April, he had huge months in May and June, truly showing his high ceiling as a player. This included a 35-game span in which he homered 16 times. This was enough to earn him an all-star nod, but the second half of the season saw him miss a few weeks here and there due to injury and saw his performance suffer. 2014 was his worst full season in the league, and 2015 was his last chance with Philadelphia, where he did not impress enough to remain on the roster. He had a few more chances, signing minor league deals with the Blue Jays and Rockies, but he was never able to come close to replicating his 2013 excellence. He last played in the Mexican League in 2019 and has worked as an assistant in the Phillies farm system since then. Overall, injuries and inconsistency prevented Brown from reaching his ceiling, but he did quite well for a 20th round draft pick. Everyone watching this video knows Bryce Harper. Everyone in 2011 knew Bryce Harper. Baseball people knew Bryce Harper when he was in middle school. Bryce hit a ball 570 feet when he was 15 years old. Bryce was the chosen one, the baseball equivalent of LeBron James or Wayne Gretzky, the once in a generation talent with aspirations to become the greatest baseball player who ever lived. He was supposed to graduate high school in 2011 and expected to be the first overall pick in that year's draft. However, he earned his GED in October of 2009 and enrolled in JUCO, catching for the Southern Nevada Coyotes for one season and earning the Golden Spikes Award as a 17-year-old. The Nationals selected Bryce first overall in 2010 and he played instructional league baseball in the fall, learning how to play the outfield in an effort to get him to the big leagues quicker. He found his name on this list before playing an inning of professional ball. The Nationals invited him to spring training in 2011 and he proceeded to hit nearly 400, with some questioning if he was big league ready without any minor league experience. But he started the year at A-ball and quickly jumped straight to double-A with improved numbers thanks to new contact lenses. After starting 2012 in AAA, the Nationals rushed him to the bigs in April at just 19 years of age. On his way to winning Rookie of the Year, Harper put up excellent numbers at the plate and played great defense, primarily as a center fielder. This is widely regarded as the best teenage season in league history, as he totaled 4.4 F4, more than any other teenager before him or since, and his offensive output has only been one up by eventual teammate Juan Soto in his age 19 season. Harper was an all-star in 2012 and again in 2013, but the 2013 and 14 seasons were hindered by injuries, many caused by Harper's all-out style of play. Going into 2015, expectations were still high, but many detractors believed that Harper had not lived up to his chosen one billing, and his fellow MLB players voted him as the most overrated player heading into the season in the ESPN Magazine poll. Going into his age 22 season, and perhaps fueled by the haters, Bryce proceeded to have the best offensive season since Barry Bonds in 2004. After failing to come close to repeating his otherworldly 2015, he answered the questions that arose from his 2016 struggles by putting up another incredible, albeit injury-shortened, offensive season in 2017. Harper has consistently been near the top of the league in offense, but his defense is graded anywhere from above average to bad, depending on the season. He is well on his way to the Hall of Fame and already has some big moments in his first couple years with the Phillies. It's hard to evaluate Harper's career against the outlandish expectations, and although someone else on this list has fulfilled the chosen one prophecy, it's hard to say anything bad about Harper's career at this point, and it's also easy to forget that he's just 28 and has at least a decade of baseball ahead of him. In 2005, Jeremy Hellickson was dominating high schoolers in Des Moines, Iowa. Perfect Game listed him as their best high school pitching prospect in the upcoming draft, but he fell to the fourth round where he was drafted by the Rays, who just couldn't miss on pitching prospects at the time. Hellickson came up as one of Tampa's yearly pitching prospects, including David Price, Wade Davis, and later, Matt Moore and Chris Archer. Hellickson was successful at every level of the minors, and likely would have been in the Rays' rotation sooner if not for their excellent pitching staff, which led him to the AL East crown in 2010. But after dominating AAA, the Rays had no choice but to call him up. After keeping his ERA under 3 in every minor league destination except for a half year at AA in 2008, every prospect ranking had Hellickson top 10. After winning Rookie of the Year in his first full season in 2011, and following that up with an excellent sophomore season, Hellickson would struggle to the point of being demoted for a mental break due to a rough stretch after the 2013 All-Star break. 
After being scouted with a fastball sitting around 93 or 94 miles per hour in high school, his average fastball velocity was barely cracking 91 by 2013. 2014 was not much better, as injuries claimed most of the season. As Tampa had a continuous stream of starters coming up from the minors, they didn't have to wait for Hellickson as he entered his arbitration seasons, so they moved him to the Diamondbacks for a couple of low to mid-level prospects. He only lasted in Arizona for one mediocre season before ending up in Philadelphia, where he had maybe his best season in the majors, free of injury with solid results and peripherals to back him up. After a week 2017 and mid-season trade to Baltimore, he signed a minor league deal with the Nationals, where he made the team as a sinker baller and was their fifth starter when he was healthy in 2018 and 2019, but in that span he only threw 130 innings. He earned a World Series ring in 2019 and retired in the offseason. Although he didn't live up to the lofty expectations that were set for him, and the injuries took away from his talent, Helixson had some good years and a pretty solid career overall. We all know who the great Mike Trout is and what he's achieved, but how did he rise through the ranks to end up number one in a prospect class packed with talent? As a star player at Millville High School, Trout broke the New Jersey High School home run record with 18 homers his senior season. He didn't get much exposure playing for a relatively small New Jersey High School, but caught the eye of some big league scouts during the perfect game tournaments in Florida and area code games in California. The Angels really liked what they saw and they picked him 25th overall in 2009 draft, one pick after selecting fellow high school outfielder Randall Grichik. Trout began at rookie ball that year and played so well that he was promoted to A ball for a few games. In 2010, he decimated A and high A level pitching, hitting for average, showing great eye at the plate, and displaying incredible speed on the bases, swiping 56 bags that year. He had not displayed much power at this point, with only 11 homers in his first two professional years, but scouts saw a build that could add weight and power numbers with age. After slashing ridiculous numbers and swiping 28 bags through 75 double A games in 2011, the Angels believed Mike was ready to make the jump straight to the bigs, filling in for the injured Peter Borges. He was mediocre on offense, but showed that he was already a great defender in the outfield, playing all three spots well. Trout began 2012 in the AAA, but was quickly recalled at the end of April after hitting over 400 in the first month of play. Despite missing the first month of the year, Trout had perhaps the best rookie season in big league history, finishing second in MVP voting only because Miguel Cabrera took home the Triple Crown. I could talk all day about Mike Trout's amazing numbers and awards over the last decade that he's been the best player in the league, or the fact that he won his first MVP in probably his worst full season, but I want to focus on his progression more than anything else. After winning that first MVP in 2014, Mike knew that he could improve his game by striking out less, as he led the AL in strikeouts that season. Since then, he's decreased his chase rate every single season, never struck out close to that percentage, and drawn walks at a higher rate almost every year. In the 2015 offseason, he was unsatisfied with the stolen base numbers that he put up, swiping only 11 bases and getting caught 7 times that year. Since then, he's stolen 88 bags and only been caught 16 times. He never had a really strong arm until 2015, when he matched his career outfield assist total in one season. Most recently, Mike stated that he was a bad outfielder last year, which isn't exactly true, but he did have one of the worst outfielder jumps in the league. This means that he'll probably grade better at that this year too. Mike is only 29, he's already a lock for the Hall of Fame, he's got 3 MVPs, 8 Silver Sluggers, 8 All-Star appearances, and is once again the best hitter in baseball this year. And his next and only remaining individual challenge is becoming the greatest of all time. Seven of these players produced in the bigs, six of them are still in the league, five are still productive, three have a shot at the Hall of Fame, two are generational players, and one has a chance to be the best player of all time. Overall, the scouts didn't do a bad job here, but it's still puzzling to see someone like Helixson ranked above Bryce Harper on any list. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. This video has been a blast to make and I'm going to have more like this out soon along with my recap videos, so please leave a like and subscribe if you've made it this far. And as always, that's baseball.